I'll just go straight to the what. It's not a teaching to time. It's not a copying of the board. It's not an interactive whiteboard time, a worksheet time, or a textbook time. Okay? It's not a time for rotational groups of children doing different activities. I'm just going to say it. We know the research says that's not powerful learning. It's hands-on learning that the kids are engaged in. Okay, and they want to go to it straight away. If they've been sitting on the floor for a warm-up, they don't want to then be sitting for another 10 or 15 minutes to be talked at about what they're going to do next. They need to get up and go and learn. But there's a whole lot of research behind that first paragraph. It's not just one researcher, hundreds. Okay, and not just researchers in numeracy, but just researchers in learning. We know how kids learn best. Can I just interrupt too? This yes. Is a, one of the papers in our folder talks about actually doing the explanation after they've done the yes. actually rather than before the explanation. The other thing, and we started talking a little bit about it in that subitizing group that I was at, that. Um, you can have lots of rich, powerful games and um, lots of good, rich, open tasks. But for learning to be powerful, it needs to be closely linked to data, ongoing formative assessment and quality feedback. Okay, I like that quote. Assessment for learning becomes formative assessment when the evidence is actually used to adapt the teaching work to meet learning needs. Doesn't matter how good the game is, doesn't matter how rich and open the task is, if I'm not using the data I get from kids as I roam around the room to adapt that task to meet their needs, it's not going, the learning will not be as powerful. And quality feedback is a part of that too. I'm not going to read all of it, but kids need to know where they're going. What maths are they learning today? Too often we don't make that clear. We've got a great task, but we don't say the maths you are learning today or the maths I want you to focus on today. Or remember, Kerry, that your next step is to count by fives and tens. Really make it clear. Where are they going? And when we give them feedback, we tell them how they're going related to that goal. And then we tell them where to next. That's all a part of it. It doesn't matter how good the task is without... And that's the hard bit of learning time. And that's the bit that, as teachers, we are just always reflecting on and refining and trying to get better at. It's ongoing. Within this, I, I'll leave the rest for you to read, but I really just also wanted to highlight this. Many of you have read the Marilyn Burns article, 10 Big Ideas, and one of hers is that confusion is a part of the process. And I really... Uh, lots of that is important, but quite often when we, we've done the warm-up and we get kids to go straight to the task, the hard bit for teachers is seeing the confusion. Sometimes they go, oh, but we're doing area and we haven't done it for a while and I'd better tell them what area it is before we start. That's, they're, they're then just using their short-term memory or what they've just heard five minutes ago to do the task. They're not really engaging in the deep understanding and the hard problem solving and the confusion that actually can lead to learning. Um, so when you are trying this, if, if the old thing you're going to throw out is that you're not going to really do much of an introduction for your learning time, you're just going to go straight to it. Be prepared for the kids being confused and that that's okay. And you use that as data to change what you do tomorrow or to change the question you ask an individual child, or to adapt the task. More buzz time needed? We'll be okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. So the question around um, zone proximal development yeah. and not having mixed, and having mixed ability, you're not saying that you don't group children according to something that they particularly need at a particular time. No. You're saying it's not groups as such that remain Not set way. groups, that's right. I think I've got there somewhere. Uh, I might also have small focus teaching groups based on observed need. Yeah. Yeah, so certainly I would pull I would pull those six 
kids down to work with me because they're all on the same learning step and I want to give them some input to direct them. Yeah. Melissa, on the, on the groupings, Anne Gervasoni, one of our powerful reflections is teaching educators and team lead, leaders, and kept saying that it, and even makes a link to the syllabus about number. And the whole notion and the underlying principle is to make alternative, so alternative possibilities apparent. So she would say that in children's responses and in these grouping and in the mixed ability, she said you will, you will get that best in a mixed ability setting. But if they're always, every day, in those, those poor kids in that bottom group who are all on the same growth point, who never get to hear an alternative possibility. Okay? So it's different. It's a good point about picking up on the small group focus teaching at the point of need, but it's very different if they're stuck in that same setting, you know, for the... 200 days of the year. And if you want to read more about that, I mean, the National Numeracy Review Report is on the NING, and if you click, you know, point nine, there's pages of research supporting um, that statement, if you really want to delve into it. What were you going to I say? I say, alternatively, too, the children who are, um, you know, at better at maths or at the higher growth points also need some time together, maybe for a table or something where you pull them out as a focus group. Because they often need to be with children that are similar <laughs> to sort of bounce ideas off each other, but not all the time. Yes, yeah. not all the time. Yeah.